Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be back at 3 ABN once again. It's always nice to come back to this neck of the woods. Believe it or not, 35 years ago, my son was born in West Frankfort, Illinois. I had the privilege of pastoring this church when it was downtown uh, for a little less than a year. I also pastored the El Dorado district, uh, which uh, I think is, what, 40 minutes from here, approximately. So we're quite well acquainted with this area. Remember the many times that we had camp meeting at Little Grassy Lake, and uh, probably some of you remember those good days, too. Before we get into our study, even though Pastor Gilly has uh, already prayed, I always uh, make it a habit to pray before I preach. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, once again we come before your throne thanking you for the privilege of being here to study your holy word. And Father, we ask that as we open the pages of your holy book that your Holy Spirit will be with us to enlighten our minds and to soften our hearts. I not only ask for those who are present here, but I also ask for all of those who are watching on television and those who are listening on the radio. And we thank you, Father, for your presence. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Tomorrow marks the 166th anniversary of what has come to be known as the Great Disappointment of 1844. And so we've decided to focus on the sanctuary during these few days that we're going to be together. And basically what we're going to do is follow Jesus through the sanctuary. You see, we can't understand what happened on October 22nd, 1844, unless we understand the previous steps that Jesus took through the sanctuary before he arrived in the most holy place. And so basically we're going to follow Jesus as he moves in and out of the sanctuary. This evening, we're going to follow Jesus into the camp, the sanctuary camp where sinners live. And we're going to see that Jesus there lived as the perfect lamb. Then we're going to follow Jesus into the court where Jesus died as the perfect lamb. And then we're going to follow Jesus into the holy place where Jesus applies the benefits of his life and his death to individual sinners. And then we're going to follow Jesus into the most holy place where we find Jesus as judge. And then finally we're going to follow Jesus as he closes the door to the most holy place and leaves the sanctuary to come to this earth. And so basically we're going to follow Jesus all through the sanctuary. We're going to f follow him to the camp, to the court, to the holy place, to the most holy place, and then eventually out of the most holy place to come back to this earth. Now the subject that we're going to study today is titled Weaving the Robe of Righteousness. And first of all we want to know what robe covers God. Before we can understand the robe that God has prepared for us, we need to understand how God is garbed. What clothes God. And so I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. And we're going to read Psalm 104 and verses 1 and 2 to find out how God is clothed. What is the garment that covers God? It says there in Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. And now verse 2 has what I particularly want us to focus on. Who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. So what is the robe that covers God? We're told here that God is covered with light like a garment. God's garment is not made out of artificial uh, cloth. It is made out of light. 
There are other passages of Scripture that point to the same reality. For example, Daniel 7, 9 and 10 says that the garments of the Father were white as snow. We're told in Matthew 17 verse 2 that when Jesus was transfigured His garments were white as light. And I like the way that Luke presents it. In Luke chapter 9 verse 29 speaking about the transfiguration it says that His garments were glistening or shining. In other words the garments that cover God are garments of light. But now the question is what do those garments of light represent? What is the symbolic value of that literal garment of light that covers God? Well in Isaiah 61 we find the answer to this question. Isaiah 61 and verse 10 we find what those garments symbolize or what those garments of light represent. They symbolize or represent something. It says in Isaiah 61 and verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So even though God is covered with a literal robe of light, a physical robe of light, that robe of light symbolizes or represents His righteousness as it says here. Now we all know that God decided at some point past about 6,000 years ago to create Adam and Eve. And it was the purpose of God that Adam and Eve should reflect His glory. You see it was God's plan that He as the Son would shine upon Adam and Eve and they would reflect His glory like the moon reflects the glory of the sun. Have you ever thought about the idea that the moon is actually covered with the glory of the sun? And so it was God's plan that Adam and Eve be like the moon, that they should reflect the glory of God. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25 that originally Adam and Eve were naked. Now that doesn't mean that they didn't have any covering. What it means is that they did not have any garments artificially made. They actually had garments that were composed of light because they were reflecting the robe of glory that God had. We're told in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25 and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And the reason why they were not ashamed is because they were covered with the robe of God's light. They were reflecting the light of God. Kind of reminds me of that text in Revelation 12 verse 1 where it speaks about the true church and we're told that the woman was clothed with the sun. You see the clothing with which God garbed Adam and Eve was a garment of glorious light. In other words they were physically, literally covered with a robe of light. But like God that robe of light that covered Adam and Eve symbolized something. It represented something. It represented their righteousness. The fact that they were covered with righteousness. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45, Ellen White describes the clothing that was worn by our parents, our original parents. This is what Ellen White had to say. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory such as the angels wear. So long as they lived in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. And you know it's interesting, she says that the clothing that covered Adam and Eve was like the clothing that covers the angels. You know if you look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 4, speaking of the two angels that came to the sepulcher, we're told that the garments of the two angels gleamed like lightning. In other words, the angels are also covered with a robe of light. Further, Ellen White says this in uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 310 and 311, once again amplifying this idea of the original clothing that covered Adam and Eve. We're told there, 
the white robe of innocence. What did the white robe represent? Innocence or righteousness because they weren't sinners. And so the white robe of innocence was worn by first parents when they were placed by God in holy Eden. And now she explains why these robes covered Adam and Eve. She continues saying they lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. All the strength of their affections was given to their Heavenly Father. In other words they were covered with the spiritual robe of righteousness because they lived in conformity to the law of God. They had righteousness spiritually speaking. But you know what? They were also covered with a glorious robe of physical light. Notice what Ellen White continues saying in this magnificent book Christ's Object Lessons page 311. A beautiful soft light. The light of God enshrouded the holy pair. This robe, now listen carefully, this robe of literal light she says it was a soft light, the light of God that covered them. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. And so you notice they were covered with a robe of literal physical light, but that literal physical light represented their innocence or their righteousness. So as God had a physical robe of light, but that represented God's righteousness, so Adam and Eve who reflected God's glory were covered with a robe of physical literal light but that represented their innocence or represented their righteousness. If they had obeyed God they would have conserved both the physical robe and the spiritual robe of righteousness. But we all know the story. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. Let's read about it in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 and I'm sure that we've read this many times before probably but I think it would be good for us to read it again. Genesis 3 verse 6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Now I want you to notice what the first result of their sin was. Now they had broken their relationship with God and notice what the very first result was. Genesis 3 verse 7 the very next verse says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. What had happened with the robe of light that enshrouded Adam and Eve? The robe of physical light had left and suddenly they see that they don't have the robe of light and for the first time they realize that they're naked and the Bible says that they are ashamed. Now what I want you to notice is first of all they lost their spiritual robe of light because they lost their righteousness. But as a result of that they lost their physical robe of light which was the glorious light that enshrouded Adam and Eve. In other words they first lost their spiritual robe and then they lost their physical robe. They lost their righteousness and in consequence they lost their robe of light. And as a result now they are physically naked. You see because they're spiritually naked their body becomes now physically naked. Now the question is how did Adam and Eve try to solve this problem of spiritual nakedness that led to literal nakedness? Genesis 3 verse 7 the last part of the verse has the answer. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Did you notice here that we're told that they 
sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. In other words, they were going to cover the shame of their nakedness by these fig leaves made by their own hands. But you know what's interesting? Even after covering themselves with the fig leaves, they still felt naked because they did not have the robe of light because they did not have righteousness. They had lost the spiritual robe and therefore they had lost the literal robe of light. And by the way, the plan of salvation contemplates restoring both robes. The whole purpose of the plan of salvation is to restore the spiritual robe of righteousness which will lead to the restoring of the physical robe of light that covered Adam and Eve originally. Now let me ask you, what did those fig leaves represent? Those fig leaves, those aprons represented something. And the question is, what did they represent? Well, let's allow the context to tell us what those uh, fig leaves represented. Genesis 9 and verses 9 to 13. Genesis 9 verses uh, 3, excuse me, verses 9 to 13. It says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. But the previous verses tell us, tell us that he had already covered himself with fig leaves. Why does he still feel naked? Because he did not have the robe of light. Notice verse 11. And he said, this is God speaking, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Let me ask you, is Adam trying to justify his sin? Yes. He's trying to cover his unrighteousness by justifying his sin, by giving an excuse or an argument explaining why he had done what he did. And then notice verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent, by the way, the serpent that God had made, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Is Eve trying to justify her sin? She most certainly is. And so the fig leaves represent our attempt to justify our sin, according to the context. Now allow me to read you an interesting statement that we find in the writings of Ellen White. This is Review and Herald, November uh, 15, the year 1898. Notice what she said about the fig leaves. And by the way, I noticed the biblical context first so that you see that the spirit of prophecy is in harmony with the biblical context. This is what she says. The fig leaves represent the arguments used to cover disobedience. When the Lord calls the attention of men and women to the truth, the making of the fig leaves into aprons will be begun to hide the nakedness of the soul. But the nakedness of the sinner is not covered. All the arguments pieced together by all who have, who have interested themselves in this flimsy work will come to naught. And so basically the fig leaves represent Adam and Eve's attempt to justify their sin. And by the way, there's a lot of justifying of sin that goes on today. People say, well, pastor, the flesh is weak. The enticements of the world are too strong. The devil made me do it. My parents gave me a bad example. I was born that way. It's in my genes. It's the wife or the husband that you gave me. I grew up in a bad environment. We give all kinds of reasons, all kinds of arguments to justify our sin. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did. But all of the fig leaves that we create will nev never cover the shame of our nakedness. And so because Adam and Eve had lost their spiritual robe of righteousness and they had lost their literal robe of light, as a result, God pronounced upon them the sentence of death. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. God is speaking to Adam and he says, In the sweat of your face 
you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return now let's review the very important steps that led ultimately to Adam's Adam and Eve's death number one they sinned number two because they sinned they lost their spiritual robe of righteousness as a result of losing their spiritual robe of righteousness they lost their physical robe of light that covered them but ultimately they were going to suffer the greatest nakedness of all and that is the nakedness of death do you know that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 compares the decomposition of the body in the grave as being naked in other words nakedness of soul leads to nakedness of body which leads ultimately to the nakedness of death and so Adam and Eve were doomed now what is it that happened the law demands perfect righteousness the law of God demands sinless perfection if you don't offer the law sinless perfection the result is that you have sinned we all know that text in first John chapter 3 and verse 4 and I'm reading from the King James Version whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is the transgression of the law so in other words the sin the, the, the law demands absolute sinless perfection if you don't render the law sinless perfection that is sin and the Bible tells us that the consequence of sin is death notice for example Romans 6 23 it says for the wages of sin is what death Romans 5 verse 12 says therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death passed to all men because all men sinned so we notice here that the law demands perfection if we don't render the law perfection it's sin the consequence of sin is death and the Bible tells us that all have sinned and therefore all of us are on death row in fact Romans 3 verse 23 and uh, Romans 3 verse 10 say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God there is none righteous no not one and so you can see the predicament that Adam and Eve and all of their descendants were in as a result of not rendering the law perfect obedience with the law requires man is a sinner because he's a sinner the Bible says that he deserves death and because all have sinned everyone deserves the ultimate nakedness which is death now the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve should have died the very day that they sinned notice Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 it's speaking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we've read this verse many times before it says but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die when were they going to die in the what in the day that you eat of this tree you will surely die and they ate they lost their spiritual robe they lost their literal robe the sentence of death was pronounced God said this very day but we all know that Adam and Eve did not die that very day now some people say well they started dying because they died spiritually and so on but there's a more accurate explanation to why Adam and Eve did not die precisely that very day you see that very day a very important ceremony took place that ceremony is described in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21 
And then I want to read you an interesting statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. Always go to the Spirit of Prophecy in confirmation of what Scripture has to say. She amplifies and helps us understand a little bit more amply what Scripture says. Genesis 3 verse 21 says here, Also for Adam and his wife, somebody else is doing this, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. Who made the tunics? God. Who clothed them? God. What were the tunics made out of? They were made out of skins. Now let me ask you, how do you get the skin of an animal? You have to kill the animal. There was a death that very day. And most likely it was a lamb because Jesus is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Other texts say from the foundation of the world. So most likely it was a lamb. In other words, a lamb was slain that day. God took the skins of this blameless, immaculate lamb and with the skins he covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve, the physical nakedness of Adam and Eve. In the journal, the Bible Echo, May 21, 1900, we find these very significant words written by Ellen White. She says, The instant Adam yielded to Satan's temptation and did the very thing which God had said he should not do, Notice the same instant. Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. Give him another trial. Transgression placed the whole world under the death sentence. But in heaven there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom. And that happened the very day that Adam and Eve sinned. God was saying the way in which your nakedness is going to be covered is as a result of a perfect immaculate lamb being slain. And that is going to cover the shame of your nakedness. Now this lamb ceremony indicated that Jesus had to do two things. Usually we think of one, but really two. First of all, the lamb had to be immaculate and perfect. You see, even before the lamb was sacrificed, the priest had to make sure that the lamb was without blemish. And we're going to find that the lamb without blemish represents the life of Jesus Christ. And then that lamb without blemish afterwards was sacrificed. And by the way, this plan was made from the ceaseless ages of eternity, but was only implemented when man sinned. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. Here it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And now notice this. As of a lamb without what? Without blemish and without spot. So what is the first thing that you, that you see about the lamb? Is it the death of the lamb? Or is it the fact that the lamb is without blemish? Notice that... that the death of Jesus would have had no value unless Jesus had lived a perfect unblemished life. And sometimes we start the sanctuary service in the court. The sanctuary service doesn't start in the court. It starts in the camp where sinners live. We're going to notice that in a few moments. So notice what it says, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. In other words, what Scripture is telling us is 
that Jesus Christ was going to come as the Lamb of God to live a perfect, unblemished life. And after he had lived his unblemished life, he was going to the cross and he was going to pay our debt of sin. In other words, Jesus first of all came to the camp and only afterwards went into the court. And some people say, well, why did Jesus come to live his perfect life? Why did he come to die? Simply, folks, because he was taking the place of every human being who has ever lived on planet Earth. And you say, why could Jesus live the life that we should live? Why could Jesus die the death that we all should die? The reason is very simple. The Bible tells us that Jesus created us all. And only He who created all could offer His life in place of all. Notice John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 where we're told that Jesus was the creator of everything. Every human being on planet earth. It says there in John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And sometimes when I say, you know, that Jesus created all human beings, somebody comes and says, Pastor Bohr, but I was born from my mother. I say, oh, okay, good. Who was your mother born from? Oh, she was born from her mother. Okay, and who was her mother born from? If you go back far enough, where do you end up? With Adam and Eve. When Jesus created Adam and Eve, He created the whole human race. And by the way, by creating us, Jesus was responsible for our existence. And because Jesus felt responsible for our existence, He says, I'm going to provide a way of escape. I'm going to live the life that they should live. I'm going to weave the robe that they should wear, and I'm going to die the death that they should die. I am going to be their substitute in terms of my life and in terms of my death, so that they can have righteousness and so that eventually they can be covered with the glorious robe of physical light. And so the first thing that Jesus does is He comes to this earth to live as the immaculate Lamb of God. In other words, Jesus didn't come first to the court of the sanctuary where the, where the altar of sacrifice was. Jesus came to the camp where sinners live because He was going to live the life in our midst that we should live. In other words, the sanctuary begins in the camp. The sanctuary begins with the perfect life of Jesus in our midst. You're all acquainted with John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. By the way, do you know that word dwelt is the, the Greek word skenoo, which means He pitched His tent among us. It could be translated, He tabernacled among us. In other words, He came to the camp where our tents were pitched, and He came and pitched His tent in our midst. And so it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus came to the camp where we live, and He came with the purpose of living the life that all of us should live, facing the same trials and temptations, facing the same difficulties, coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, and conquering the flesh in the likeness of sinful flesh. And by the way, every time that Jesus Christ obeyed God in the midst of trials and tribulations, He added a thread to the robe. By His obedience, Jesus was weaving a robe of righteousness. Every time that the devil tried to get Him to entertain a sinful thought, and He said, no, I won't go there, another thread was added. Every time that Jesus said no to the devil, another thread was added. And when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, the robe was complete. It had every single thread of a perfect robe of righteousness weaved by Jesus Christ Himself. And so Jesus came to the camp to live the life that we should live. 
Now let's go to a couple of Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Jesus as the unblemished sacrifice or the unblemished lamb and the unblemished priest. Let's go in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 22 and verses 20 to 22. Leviticus chapter 22 and verses 20 to 22. It's speaking here about the animals that were offered in the sacrificial service. Even before the animals were killed, the animals had to be without blemish, which, rep which rep represents the perfect life of Jesus Christ. It represents all the threads that Jesus put on the robe of righteousness. He lived a righteous life so that He could give us that righteous life. Notice Leviticus 22 verse 20. Whatever has a defect you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow, or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs you shall not offer to the Lord nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar of the Lord. Now what do those victims represent? Those lambs and those rams without defect, without blemish. They represented the life of of Jesus Christ. The unblemished sinful life of Jesus. His robe of righteousness which he wove in our midst, in the camp where we live. But it wasn't sufficient for Jesus to be a perfect lamb. He also had to be an unblemished priest. Notice what we find in Leviticus chapter 21 and verses 17 to 21. Leviticus chapter 21 and verses 17 through 21. It's speaking here about those who could serve as priests. Speak to Aaron saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach. A man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or broken hand, or is a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab, or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. And so the Old Testament sacrificial service said that the victim had to be without blemish and the priest also had to be without blemish. This was even before the animal was sacrificed. Now let me ask you, who is the priest represented by the sacrifice? The priest is Jesus. And what does the victim represent? The victim represents Jesus. You see in the Old Testament service you needed a priest and you needed a victim. But Jesus gathered bo both meanings within himself. Because the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus offered himself a sacrifice. In other words Jesus was the priest and Jesus was also the victim. But in order to be a priest he had to live a perfect life. In order to be a victim he had to live a perfect life. You see the robe is the perfect life of Jesus Christ. The robe, every thread, is an act of obedience of Jesus during his life. And I repeat once again when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he had placed the last thread upon that robe of righteousness which God requires from us but we can't give and so Jesus lived that life that we should live so that he could give us as a free gift the robe of his righteousness. Notice Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 where we're told 
concerning the earthly life of Jesus the following. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus was that lamb tempted in all things without sin, without blemish. Notice Hebrews 7 verse 26 where we find a description of the high priest. Hebrews 7 verse 26 it says, For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. In John chapter 8 and verse 46 Jesus asks those who were listening to him, Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? There are in the New Testament are an abundance of verses that show that Jesus lived a perfect life without sin. Every act of obedience, whether it be in thought or in action or feelings or emotions, of Jesus was an adding to the thread of his perfect robe of righteousness. So the robe of righteousness represents the perfect life of Jesus. The sinless life of Christ which we can't offer the law. But we're going to see in our study tomorrow that when we come to Jesus and we receive him, he takes the robe of his righteousness, the life that he lived and he places it upon us the spiritual robe of his own righteousness. But it wasn't enough for Jesus to come to live his perfect life in the camp with us. You see we need to start the sanctuary service in the camp, don't we? We can't start in the court. Jesus couldn't just come to die. He had the perf to be the perfect lamb who lived in our midst, who by every act of obedience wove this wonderful robe of righteousness which we cannot not offer to the Lord. But it wasn't enough for Jesus to live a perfect life. Jesus also had to suffer our penalty of death. You see at the beginning, I want you to notice this sequence of things. At the beginning we all know that man sinned. And as a result of sin, man lost his spiritual robe of righteousness because he was disobedient now. And as a result of losing his spiritual robe of righteousness, he lost the literal robe of light. And of course this would lead to the ultimate unclothing of man through death in the grave. But Jesus came to undo what Adam and Eve and all of their descendants have done. You see Jesus took our sins upon himself. Jesus took our spiritual nakedness upon himself and as a result Jesus hung on the cross totally naked. Physically speaking because Jesus was bearing our spiritual sin. Jesus now hangs physically naked just like Adam and Eve sinned and they lost their righteousness and then they lost their physical robe. Jesus Christ now is taking the sins of the world upon himself and as a result he doesn't have a robe, he's naked hanging on the cross. And I know some people say, you're saying that Jesus hung naked on the cross? You know usually artists cover up Christ's private parts. That's not biblical. Jesus hung between heaven and earth stark naked. Notice what we find in John chapter 19 verses 23 and 24. John 19, 23 and 24. Speaking about the soldiers when they were going to uh, you know cut the robe of Jesus into four parts. It says there John 19, 23, then the soldiers when they had crucified Jesus took his garments and made four parts. To each soldier a part, but now notice that he not only had garments but he also had a tunic besides that, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. That's also symbolically significant. It represents the perfect life of Christ which he wrote, wove while he was on earth. Verse 24, 
they said therefore among themselves let us not tear it but cast lots for it whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled which says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots therefore the soldiers did these things they took his garments and they took his tunic Jesus Christ hung naked on the cross of Calvary because Jesus was taking upon himself our nakedness Jesus had taken our sins and the result of sin was nakedness so Jesus now takes our sin and therefore Jesus hangs naked on the cross of Calvary and by the way he suffered the ultimate nakedness which is death Father into your hands I commend my spirit and so the law demands our death the law says hey you obey me perfectly you live you disobey me you lose your spiritual robe of righteousness you lose your physical robe of righteousness and ultimately you will be unclothed by death but the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came and he took my spiritual nakedness upon himself and he paid the penalty that I should have paid in other words in the camp Jesus lived the life that we should live and in the court Jesus died the death that we should die notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become what? a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree see we were the cursed ones but Jesus took upon himself our curse he took our sin he suffered our punishment notice 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 these are well known verses speaking about God the Father it says for he made him that is the Father made Jesus who knew no sin to be what? to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him and of course Isaiah 53 verses 5 and 6 but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all isn't this marvelous the message of the camp and the court Jesus lived a perfect life with which is his robe of righteousness and then he went to the court the cross and he suffered the penalty of death that every human being on earth should suffer and by the way the work that Jesus did in the camp and in the court he did for every single human being who has ever lived on planet earth no matter how wicked or how evil they have been the robe was weaved for everyone and the death of Jesus was a death for everyone allow me to read you several verses of the Bible that underline this point John 3 16 have you ever heard of that verse for God so loved West Frankfurt yeah West Frankfurt too for God so loved what? the world that he gave his only begotten son so for, for how many did Jesus come? came for the world but don't miss tomorrow night because tomorrow night we're going to talk about the second part of John 3 16 whosoever believeth in him because you're, you're probably thinking Pastor Vore is teaching universalism here Pastor Vore is saying that Jesus lived the life that we should live he died the death that we should die hallelujah and that's it everybody's going to be saved no because we have to receive the benefits of what Jesus did in the camp and what Jesus did in the court but his death and his life were for everyone notice first John chapter 2 and verse 2 we'll go quickly through these first John 2 verse 2 it says and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world so not only for ours but for the whole world notice Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were, now notice this, still sinners 
Christ what? Christ died for us. And of course we all know John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see what Jesus did in the camp and in the court? He did corporately for every person who has drawn breath in the history of planet earth. But as we're going to study tomorrow night, as we go into the holy place, we're going to see that there's something that we must do in order to respond to what Jesus has done. For Him to pour out the benefits of His life and His death. Allow me to close by reading you a few statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. We find in Selected Messages, volume 1, page 309, these words. On the cross of Calvary, He paid the redemption price of the race. Did you catch that? What redemption price did Jesus pay? He paid it for what? For the race. That's all of us. On page 321, Selected Messages, Volume 1, listen to this. This is powerful. The guilt of every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's Redeemer. The evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds of every son and daughter of Adam called for retribution upon himself, for he had become man's substitute. Though the guilt of sin was not his, his spirit was torn and bruised by the transgressions of men, and he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. One final statement that we find in the little booklet, Confrontation, page 17. She says, With the sins of the world laid upon Him, He would go over the ground where Adam stumbled. He would bear a test infinitely more severe than that which Adam failed to endure. Now listen to this. He would overcome on man's account and conquer the tempter that through his obedience, don't miss this, through his obedience, his purity of character and steadfast integrity, his righteousness might be imputed to man that through his name man might overcome the foe on his own account. So folks, Jesus, by coming to this earth, in the camp with us, lived the life that we should live. Jesus came to this earth and Jesus died the death that we should die. He prepared a robe of righteousness, complete with every thread through His obedience, that He can give freely to human beings. He paid the penalty that every single one of us deserves. And this He did for the whole human race, from Adam and Eve till the last person that lives on planet Earth. But there's a catch. We must come to Jesus. And we must ask Him for Him to credit His life to our account. We must come to Him and ask Him to credit His death to our account. And when we respond individually and personally, then we are accepted in the Beloved. This will be our study for tomorrow.